Well, hi! I what? I know. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Woo! All right. Well, everyone, please come into the ballroom. We are ready to begin the first plenary of Saturday of the 2017 Forward Feminism Conference. Come on in, everybody. Please take your seats. I'm Terry O'Neill. I'm the president of NOW for just a short period of time. <laughs> and I will ask Kim Villanueva, China Forts and Washington, Tony Van Pelt, Gilda Yazi, and Monica Weeks, will you please come up to the stage? <laughs> All right. So all the candidates on the stage and, uh, and the president of, I mean, the chair of the election committee, before we actually get started, before we actually completely get started, um, I will ask the chair of the credentials committee to give us an update on the numbers. So Toby Abrams, come to the stage, please. Oh, she's already here. All right. Uh, thank you, Toby. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Madam President, I'm pleased to present the following report on voting members who have been registered and credentialed as of 10 a.m. this morning. There are 482 total registered attendees. <laughs> 386 voting members, 96 non-voting members, 19 special guests and other visitors, and one parliamentarian. <laughs> On behalf of the committee, I move that the role of voting members hereby submitted be the official role of the voting members of the conference. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, the, uh, without objection, this will be the update of uh, the credentialing committee. Yeah. No. You, if you say yes, you object. So, oh, no. Thank you. Without objection, this is the official role and the official update. Thank you all so much. Now, I have an announcement. This is an update, and it's, the number is 482. For those of you that are circulating uh, resolutions by petition, your magic number is 482. You need to have 25% of 482 uh, and and that's, that's your magic number. Why? Because the petitions must be turned in by 3 p.m. today. The, last, uh, the, the next update, we want, we're not going to have an update from Toby until 3.30 today. So there will be an updated number at the 3.30 plenary just on information because so many people are going to want to know, you know how many people are here in voting. But for the petition taker, for the petition signers, 482, 25% of 482. I hope that's clear. All right. And now it is my very great pleasure to introduce the chair of the election committee. Kim Villanueva has, uh, has been chairing the committee, and honestly, for the past some months, she has executed her duties with, uh, with calm. With, with, uh, with, with calming down all, any kind of drama that might arise, and I have been so grateful to her for all the work that she has done. So Kim Villanueva, all yours. Hey, thank you and good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, well, welcome to the third plenary. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading Terry's. I'm sorry, I'm more nervous than the candidates right now. So <laughs> Today we will hear from the candidates for national officer for the National Organization for Women. Woo. I am joined now on the stage by these four extraordinary women. From Team All Feminists United Now for Women's Lives, I'm joined by Tony Van Pelt, candidate for president. And, and Gilda Yazi, candidate for vice president.
From, from Team Rise Up Now, I'm joined by China Fortson Washington, candidate for president. And, and Monica Weeks, candidate for vice president. Before our session this morning, the candidates took part in a coin toss to determine the order in which they would speak, with the winning team choosing first whether to speak first or second. Based on the results of the coin toss, the candidates will speak in the following order. Gilda Yazi, Monica Weeks, Tony Van Pelt, China Forts and Washington. Candidates for vice president will have 10 minutes each for remarks. Candidates for president will have 15 minutes each. And the timekeepers, could you raise your hands? Our right there, okay, how are you gonna designate, are you gonna designate, up? Oh, do you see the signs? It says five minutes, two minutes, and end. Okay. Sure. We'll have the timekeepers move a little closer to where the candidates are speaking. The rest of the plenary session will be dedicated to questions from the audience. So please hold all questions and applause to the end. I know it may be difficult, but we'll... <laughs> During the question period, please line up behind the microphones over here and over here at the front of the room if you would like to qu ask a question of a candidate. You will have 30 seconds to ask your question. The candidate will have one minute to respond, and then the opposing candidate will have one minute to respond to the same question. In addition, each candidate will be given one minute for closing comments, and they'll speak in reverse order. It will be Monica, Gilda, China, and then Tony. And at 11, let's see, what time are we? Let's see, so maybe at 11.45, the timekeepers could signal me, and then we'll know that it's time to go into clo closing remarks. 11.45? Okay, so without further ado, let's hear from the candidates. If you're tired of listening to me. So let's welcome our first speaker, Gilda Yazi, candidate for vice president. Thank you for that warm welcome. I do appreciate it. Of course, my name is Gilda Yazi, and I am from Durango, Colorado. I am also an enrolled member of the Navajo tribe. My, pers my, my, pers my personal history is one of two worlds, the Anglo or white world of immigrants and the Navajo world of indigenous Native Americans. Because I live on the Navajo reservation and work in nearby Durango, Colorado, I have moved between two cultures my whole life. This has taught me a lot about listening and understanding the best of very two different cultures while working on ways to improve communications so that we can better understand each other. I value my native heritage. I have advocated for tribal and indigenous issues and kept well informed about state and federal actions that may impact native concerns. I have learned to get all the facts and consider the wider implications, treat all involved in a tactful and thoughtful manner, and find like-minded allies and take decisive action. The most important part of an American Indian's life is our family. I have helped provide for my extended family of 10 brothers and sisters. In the Navajo culture, our heritage flows, flows through the women. <laughs> women enjoy the respect and dignity that comes with their Navajo heritage. I believe the feminists activism movement in most ways reflects that, those same values. I have worked in a leader in NOW for more than 20 years. I am also a lifetime member of NOW since 1996. I, yes. 
I see the need to continue working on inclusiveness. It's not just having representation of members and leadership of different skin colors, but of a thoughtful process, process of inclusion that will help determine our priorities and how we interact. Our actions need to reflect a true desire to lift all women up in a way that is sensitive and respectful of cultural, ethnic identity, ableness, nationality, and economic differences. Only then can we all become effective advocates and leaders. Our most important tasks revolve around an expanded vision of racial justice and a more intensive focus on grassroots action for reproductive justice. My work as a member on the Community Relations Commission on Durango has been invaluable. Our mission is to encourage social harmony among residents and visitors through education and conflict resolution, to promote responsible actions and positive examples of mutual respect and inclusive community participation. It is these elements that are, I believe are critical practices for feminist leaders. As NOW's Vice President, I will mentor young feminists to develop and expand outreach and training programs for the next generation of feminist leaders at the community level. <laughs> My career as a self-employed businesswoman has offered opportunities to work with local, state, and federal government agencies and Native nations. This work involves developing budget, managing, and making sure the project is done satisfactorily and on time. This financial management experience will be key in my work as vice president. The same experience has led me as a now board member to also work on the budget and national conference committees. This work has also enabled me to chair the Structure and Modernization Committee. I helped facilitate a very challenging effort to update the organization so now can be more effective in the 21st century. Yes. Thank you. I am proud of my role as a principal organizer of the 2005 Women of Colors and Allies Summit. It is my desire to have these summits more often in cities across the country. Mm -hmm. Currently, I serve on the national board representing the Western District. I am on the budget committee and I and I understand the organization's financial status. It is an important measure of NOW's progress that we have attained financial strength and stability. As president, I do want to continue that progress forward for financial stability. NOW can and will be a strong outspoken advocate against the unjust actions of the current White House and Congress. <laughs> Through our political action committee, we can help elect committed feminist women and men to Congress and state legislatures, especially as we anticipate the 2020 census and the redistricting. Nevada's recent re Recent ratification of the ERA has shown us that when we elect progressive feminists to offices at state legislator legislatures, our issues thrive. Mm -hmm. This work is absolutely critical. And I want to be part of the now feminist leadership team 
which will be pivotal in safeguarding our rights and working for a vision of a just and equal future for all. Together, we are now strong. Vote for Tony and Gilda. Okay. Next, I would like to call to the stage Monica Weeks, candidate for vice president from Rise Up Now. <laughs> I paid them to do that. Uh, good afternoon, buen día. Thank you, there we go, getting some bilingualness in here. My name is Monica Weeks, I'm a first generation Cuban American feminist and I want to be your vice president. I only have 10 minutes guys. I have to say, what a great time it is to be a feminist, isn't it? Yeah, no, yeah, some of it was quiet over here. You're probably thinking, um, Monica, do you know who's in the White House right now? Do, do you know who's leading Congress? Of course I do. I would love a do-over. That would be amazing. But we probably wouldn't have what we have right now. We have the biggest year for feminism in generations. This year started with one of the most amazing experiences of my life. With fists raised high, hundreds of thousands of women from all backgrounds across the country, across the world, poured into the streets together in solidarity to put our president on notice that women are watching and we're united. He will not be getting away with any pussy grabbing on our watch. My mo <laughs> I knew my mother was gonna die of shame for me saying that in public. <laughs> She's the one right there in red. Um, that, my now sisters, is what feminism looks like. Today's resistance movement was started by women and continues to be led by women. It is up to us to draw on the great past of now to help pave the way for now's future. An organization built on feminist ideology must harness today's vibrant energy, tap into the revitalized feminist movement, and deliver real results for women. With, thank you. With the great work done by Terry O'Neill and Bonnie Grabenhofer, the organization is ready to be catapulted into its next stage of brilliance. China and I stand ready and willing to take it there. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm 29 years old. I come from parents who are work courses and expect nothing less of me. I've been working since the age of 10 in my father's landscaping business. And then at the age of 11, I uh, worked my way up to be seventh grade student council president. If you think this election is contentious, I mean. <laughs> Since then, I was the first in my family to graduate from university with a bachelor's degree. Uh, and I did it right here at UCF. UCF. Go Knights, yeah. I studied international relations uh, as an undergrad and then went on to get my master's in Latin American and Caribbean studies and I focused on gender. I got to travel to Nicaragua for my master's thesis, which focused on women fighting for political freedom while also providing for their families and leading the feminist movement in Nicaragua. And I published that thesis as a book. Yeah, I, know. I then worked for the World Resources Institute where I not only managed a core of team of 25 people, but I also built a $3.2 million fundraising strategy and annual project plan. I left that job to work full time for the Hillary Clinton campaign in Iowa, where I helped to organize large scale events and manage a caucus of over 500 people in my precinct. I have been a leader of DC Now since I moved there and I currently serve as president. As part of my DC Now leadership experience, I have helped lead the successful lobby effort with a coalition of over 125 organizations to pass the most progressive paid family leave policy in this country. Thank you. I'm a National Now board member, which has allowed the opportunity for me to see and understand firsthand the inner workings of the organization, especially the duties and responsibilities of the president and vice president. In addition, I own my own business, which has grown significantly since I established the LLC. 
My client base is rapidly expanding and includes established brands such as Amazon and Uber Eats. So while my energy, language, and tech savviness match my age, my experience and wisdom match that of someone older. And I want to continue sharing with you who I am, what has made me the person I am today. I come from a long line of strong, independent women who always considered themselves equal to or greater than men. And they're better, they're better, let's be real. I thought that meant they understood themselves to be feminists, but they didn't identify that way. My introduction to US feminism came from my now husband, that hottie back there, who shared with me his feminist reading assignments for the women's studies classes he was taking in college. And when I saw, yeah, he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> And when I saw feminist theory in practice in Nicaragua, I knew I was just scratching the surface of feminism and kept working to discover more. And it took my leaving Florida to discover that I'm a woman of color. <laughs> when I first moved to DC and started networking with women's groups and young women, noticed, I noticed that they were mostly white. When they would find out I was Cuban, I would be directed to women of color groups. I, I felt confused and forced to reconcile with this newly found identity, woman of color. I felt like I was an imposter, as I do not carry the weight of my skin around like my black or Afro-Latinx sisters do. But I also wondered why the women of color are always separated out. When I learned about intersectionality, I realized it is who I am. It's how I live. It is the only way to move the feminist movement forward. It is the key to now survival. <laughs> Equality cannot happen if it does not happen for all. And equality cannot happen if some are left behind. I come from a family where my dad is an IBEW union member for over 35 years. And my mother, who's from Cuba, is a small business owner. She's been a lifetime community organizer advocating for Latinos in our community who do not have a voice. See, growing up in my community, and China's too, we believe it takes a village for equality and advancement to be realized. We believe that by raising up others, we are all stronger. We are more powerful as one when everybody's contributions are part of a forward-thinking strategy. We see this as a philosophy now should embrace wholeheartedly and how we must change the organization's identity. And it starts with new faces for the organization's leadership. To let those who sometimes do not see people who look like them in the feminist community know that they have a place in now's feminist community. China and I would like to expand the organizations that NOW is working with to build stronger, more vibrant intersectional coalitions, including Latinx organizations, service sororities, and communities of faith. We want to share NOW's membership and we want to expand our membership. Not only is diversity and race and ethnicity important, but so is age. As a millennial, living in a time of political resistance, I think it's important to attract and welcome more young feminists. And you can see from my team, we've done that. The way to do that is to help now better communicate our work. China and I would like to use different social media platforms such as YouTube and Snapchat to engage this new generation. We also want to help local and state chapter leaders do the same by creating toolkits and social media plans to teach you how to use them. I know these platforms can be intimidating at first. To be honest, when I was starting my own business, I had issues. But with patience and training, anyone can use them. I know because I taught my whole team how to use Google Docs and MailChimp and they love them. They love them. <laughs> China and I would also like to honor NOW's commitment to working globally as written in the national bylaws. We feel strongly that working globally will be the only way to change public opinions and culture. <laughs> and finally, we want to encourage and support NOW activists to run for office and provide the necessary tools to do so. We want to help generate candidates and campaigns that support a progressive feminist agenda and who support, support the most marginalized communities, including our trans allies, people of color, and people with disabilities. China and I have lots of ideas and plans for now. We have the energy, the drive, and skills, as well as the professional and educational experience to help now see its best days. China is a natural leader, and she's someone who has an easy disposition with people. She will be a great spokesperson for the organization and she has a lot of experience reaching out to organizations and forming partnerships. She's caring and compassionate, which I know will make her an excellent president and boss. 
I have years of experience in nonprofit management and running my own business. I am tech savvy and love working on organizational development and analyzing how to make things more efficient. I have legislative and lobbying experience by shepherding two bills through DC government. We both love to manage people, have a similar work ethic, and believe in a strong work-life balance. Between the two of us, I mean, we have every job descriptor covered, guys. But we also have, which most importantly you will not find on a resume, is passion, dedication, open hearts and minds, and a vision to make now's future the brightest it can be. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. As a bi-ethnic young woman from a working class immigrant family and a first generation university graduate, it is a huge honor to be considered for this position of vice president. Rise Up Now is a team of leaders up to the task of strengthening and revitalizing our organization and movement. Movements are not successful unless it has a cohesive group of people working together for the same goal. Now grassroots activists are the heart and soul of this organization. We ask for your vote and thank you very much. You know, we're doing very good at holding questions, but we're not doing very well at holding the applause. But I think excellent speeches by both wonderful candidates. I'm so proud that we have two outstanding candidates for vice president. So thank you both. Now I'd like to call to the stage uh, candidate for president, Tony Van Pelt. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tony Van Pelt, and I am running for the president of the National Organization for Women. And I ask for your vote. I want to thank the organizers of this conference. Haven't they done a great job? Okay. And I want to say thank you to the hotel staff for their very hard work for us. And of course, thank you to all of you for participating in this important election. There is no other organization quite like now that so clearly symbolizes the uniquely American motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. This is the place where we bring many points of views from our personal life experiences and respond as one. We recognize that many of us have double, triple, or multiple burdens of sexism, racism, heterosexism, classism, mental or physical disabilities. We stand with each other and for each other recognizing, calling out the harms of oppression and working to end them. This is the very definition of intersectionality. Let me tell you why I've been so active in the movement. In November of 1989, I took a stand because Roe versus Wade, the law of the land that made abortion legal, was challenged and limited by the Supreme Court decision of Webster. The Florida Republican governor, Bob Martinez, declared Florida would be the first state to limit women's right to choose abortion. The court ruling was what finally moved me to action. I knew how important safe and legal abortion is. I didn't want other women to suffer the way that my mother had, my aunts had, my friends had, or I had. So I decided to join NOW. My very first NOW action was helping to organize 10,000 women to march on Tallahassee. Yeah. Florida now planned to make Bob Martinez a one-term governor, and he was. 
We won. We did it because we took action. I have traveled the globe championing feminism for much of my life. The past two years, I've been meeting with the grassroots and I've listened. I've listened to you. I've listened to your concerns and I've listened to your thoughts. And when I was approached to run, I listened. I listened to your vision for now's future. And I realized I shared that vision. And through sheer experience, I had the skills necessary to serve and lead. I've heard your excitement, your anger, your hunger for leadership. I know that you're ready to go home and to get to work advancing our agenda, fighting our opponents at the ballot box, in the streets and in the media, with fresh, experienced, ethical leadership at your side. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna be there. For the first time in now's history, we will have the leadership of an American Indian woman raised in a matriarchal society, my running mate, Gilda Yazi. Yeah. Yeah. But I know what you really want to know about is what Gilda and I plan for the future, what our vision is for now. I pledge with the will of the body to initiate absentee voting in these all important elections and live stream all of our plenaries and workshops. Gelda and I are bold and we're unafraid to take on those who oppress us. First and foremost, first and foremost, we will drive the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, yeah, baby, yeah. Nevada passed this year, why not Illinois or Virginia next? For too long, the anti-woman forces have been on the offensive, well, no more. We are instituting the Why Campaign. Why do women need to be written into the Constitution? Why were women left out in the first place? We will educate, we will agitate, and we will pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, yeah, we will, we're gonna. We have a trump demic on our hands. The rug is being pulled out from underneath us. Every advance that we've made is being dismantled. What will we tell our daughters? Poverty for women in this country is a big issue. 70% of poor pregnant women rely on government assistance. The fake GOP health care bill mentions pregnancy 11 times, denies funding for abortion, allows pregnancy discrimination, and makes pregnancy a condition for denying Medicaid. Yeah. Insurance will no longer cover maternity care or mat emergency services related to pregnancy for all women. And Planned Parenthood is losing its funding. So no coverage for birth control, no coverage for prenatal care, no coverage for child care, no ch coverage for childbirth, and no coverage for a child after it's born. Yeah. To add insult to injury, the bill doesn't mention the word woman once. We are being made invisible, but we are not going to allow that to happen. Yeah. We are not. I'm an experienced congressional lobbyist and I'm a recognized coalition leader. Send me to Washington and I'll hit the ground running, taking action, increasing membership and fundraising. Now was there in 1994 leading the way on the Violence Against Women Act. We rallied in 95 to demand full funding and we demand its full enforcement today. We are proud that the Violence Against Women Act includes tribal authority to deal with domestic violence in Indian country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We must end the rape culture on our campuses, in the military, in immigration detention centers, and in our homes. Yeah. Guns kill hundreds of women and family members every day. 
and the LGBTQIA world and marginalized communities, domestic and sexual violence is rarely reported. That must end. Yeah, that must end. And the Trump administration wants to defund the Violence Against Women Act and disappear the problem, disappear women, make us invisible. We will not allow that. Send me to Washington, D.C., and I'll hit the ground running, taking action, increasing membership, and fundraising. The good news? The en tremendous energy unleashed by the resistance to Trump is swelling the ranks of our membership. We're going to take advantage of that and build on it. We will build now into the strongest, largest organization it has ever been. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to make the anti-woman agenda of the GOP, is that GOP, the major issue of the 2018 elections. Yeah. We've already started identifying feminists to run for office. We are going to activate our base, knock on doors, hand out literature, make phone calls, send out emails, use social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and become Twitter activists. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to produce 30 and 60 second online campaigns. I've traveled the country to campaign. I know the actions is in the states. I also know that's where the expertise is, and we're going to mobilize. We will ask those of you who are able to travel, to work in those campaigns, and we will raise funds for our candidates. Trump and his leadership often display contempt for our democracy by trading in lies, celebrating violence, disdaining a free press, deriding minorities and their rights, and threatening to weld the powers of government against women and political enemies. Send me to Washington, D.C., and I'll hit the ground running, leading actions, rising up now in the media, increasing membership and fundraising. After the November election, many young women started searching online for organizations they could join to fight for our rights. Look around you. Many of them are here in this room right now. Yeah. Yeah. We have the opportunity to embrace them and offer a way to sharpen their skills and increase their knowledge base. And importantly, we need to learn from them. Yeah, millennials are talented, they're trained in ways longtime activists are not, using new technologies. I want to tell you about a new Twitter training tool created by a young feminist in a brainstorming session that we recently had. It's called Ask the Activists, real-time answers to need-to-know questions. Our conferences will offer a millennial workshop track on issues of importance that they identify, that they organize, that they lead. We plan to build high school and college students to elected official pipeline. We will work with high school clubs, women's studies programs, and 4-H clubs in both cities and rural areas. The grassroots have been neglected for too long. So I'm just wanting you to know that one of the first things we're going to do is update the leader section documents on our website, like almost immediately. <laughs> Chapters need training in fundraising, organizing, taking action to insist, persist, resist. You can count on us to be there with you. We will, inter inter we will institute intersectional grassroots activism to counter the many anti-woman low-income worker, people of color, and LGBTQIA initiatives. We'll partner with diverse community coalitions to highlight diverse div disparity in wages for minority women. We pledge to present to the National Board a slate of diverse advisors that include young feminists, Latinas, African Americans, and national leadership. Racism is insidious cultural disease.
We, pro we will prioritize training on unlearning racism and recognizing privilege. We will focus on ending voter suppression in its many forms. And we will call for a complete overhaul of the criminal justice system that is killing our black men and women. We will continue to partner with the African American Policy Forum in forming our intersectionality work. When LGBTQ plus Americans are still being denied basic rights, when hardworking Americans are fired, turned away from housing, health care, credit, and education, murdered because of who they are, it is clear we must do much more to uphold America's promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all Americans. <laughs> Under our leadership, now we'll add a new national action campaign to advocate for the passage of the Equality Act, the historic comprehensive bill to end discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community once and for all. It should not matter who you are, it doesn't matter who you love. We all have the right to, to, and we are all created equal and have the right to equal protection, every American. With your help, we're going to keep now strong and financially healthy. We're going to increase our membership and lift up now. Now more than ever, now's unapologetic, feminist voice and grassroots strengths are needed. Vote for Tony and Gilda. We are now strong. Thank you, Tony. I think you took my script. Oh. oh. That's okay. You don't, you don't want me to ad lib. Ask my Illinois Now sisters, believe me. Uh, next, I would like to call China Fortson Washington to the stage. She is candidate for president from Rise Up Now. I can't hear you. Let's try this again. Everybody, we're all women. We're supposed to be united. Let me hear a united voice out there for the women that are sitting in this audience. You guys are some really committed and beautiful activists. So I want to hear a unified and united voice. Good morning. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now I can get to my speech. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here this morning. And as I said before, when I stand up here and I look out, what I see is, wow, ain't no stopping us now. <laughs> and first and foremost, I want to thank you for being committed activists and the National Organization for Women. I want to acknowledge and recognize each and every one of you for your hard work. So from me to you, I want to say thank you. I am so proud to be standing up here running for president for the National Organization for Women. With Monica Weeks as my slate mate, and I call her, she's my twin that was born prior to me, or I'm her twin being born prior to her. So I have to give her mother lots of credit, so thank you. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from Seattle slash Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> we are the wild women from the West the Pacific Northwest. We, in, we enjoy having the rainy but fabulous Tacoma, Washington, Seattle, Washington. We come to you and we create feminist trouble wherever we go. And it's now 2017 and I stand here talking about issues that we were fighting 10 years ago, and we're still fighting them. Some people are saying 30, and I'll go with that. 
10 years ago is the statement that I'm using out marching and fighting on the ground of issues that we are still trying to get a handle on. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. We are fighting the same shit that we were fighting 10 years ago. Even though we should be tired, even though I should be tired, I'm not tired. I'm ready to lead the charge because we have to continue this battle. We have to continue this fight. Not just part of us, but all of us. If you're ready to lead the charge, you're ready to stand with Monica and I as a team. We use team as our approach to anything because without you, there is no national organization for women. And I stand here today asking you for your support for me and Monica to be part of that team. And I have to tell you, I did not make this decision lightly because this work is not for the faint of heart. I had some great inspiration advisors that brought me to the place where I said, hmm, I guess my next um, journey on my life is to become president for the National Organization of Women. <laughs> Now has been a part of my life for so long, I just schedule it temporarily in on my calendar. My youngest daughter was born, and I remember going to NOW meetings, and she was being passed around the table <laughs> as we were doing business. I think she was a feminist before she could walk. <laughs> and I've been a leader in NOW for decades. I served on the national board for two terms. I served as the regional director for two terms. I served the Tacoma, Washington chapter as a secretary, treasurer, vice president. I chaired NOW's racial justice committee. We started the Women of Color Caucus, worked on women of color and allies conferences locally and globally and nationally. One of my greatest experiences was working on the Modernization Committee, which was chaired by Patricia Ireland. And let me tell you, she is a taskmaster. And for three years, we organized webinars, workshops, outreach to NOW members. What was working, and we wanted to find out what was working and what wasn't working, what wasn't working so that we can improve the organization structure and processes. And that is the only way you can actually get to an organization to make it better is to understand the process and the procedures as you move forward. In addition to my leadership with NOW, I have a personal background in advocacy, fundraising, program development, and management. I earned my bachelor's degree from Evergreen State College which is a social justice college. I was, only, I was not only a student, but I was also a mother of a toddler. I was also working full time. And if that's not intersectionality in action, I don't know what is. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, I decided to volunteer to become a part of the Beijing's Women's Conference in 1995. <laughs> we built a delegation to go to Beijing. And believe it or not, I don't know how many of you remember Hillary's speech. 
I was honored to be able to be a witness to that speech where she declared that women's rights are human rights. That experience in organizing helped me with my skill set to work with protocol and process on global and international women's issues. My international work again continued with working with an NGO around a project for a conference for women in Russia. My most impactful international work came when I co-wrote a federal grant, a successful federal grant, for an exchange with the city of Tacoma, sister city in George, South Africa. That allowed me to be part of creating the first domestic violence shelter in George, South Africa. <laughs> this was a significant time in South Africa's history as apartheid had just ended. I was able to meet with the first women of parliament that was elected after apartheid. We brought community program providers from the U.S. to South Africa to assist with domestic violence and, and uh, sexual assault, I'm sorry, sexual assault issues. When we got over there, we were the experts. Well, let me put it this way. To our surprise, domestic violence, violence against women was part of their constitution let me try that one more time. Domestic violence and violence against women was in their constitution as a human rights violation. That leads me to let you know that women that are working globally and internationally around women's and girls' issues are sometimes way ahead of us. And we, as an organization, can learn a lot from their experiences and what they've already started. Thank you. I worked for 20 years to support survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. The city of Tacoma hired me to design and implement the first Violence Against Women office that ordered direct services for victims and survivors. Our office became a model office for training, police training, judges training, and planning community and organizational DV services with other agencies. During the work, I probably was tested the most. I had challenges that I have never faced before. Late one night, there was a knock on my door. It was the police officers. They told me me and my daughter had to leave because the DC sniper was out actually killing people that was supporting his wife. I was his wife's advocate. He was my mechanic. I had been an advocate for an abused wife for of many people before, but that one was one of the most challenging. Did I back down? No, just part of the job. I continued to do my job. In 2006, I assisted another woman that was abused. Her abuser decided that he was gonna get me fired because I was helping her. He stalked me, he harassed my family. In the end, he did get me fired. It took me three years to fight to get my name and my reputation back. But you know what? I ended up retiring from the city of Tacoma with full benefits. <laughs> did I back down? No. Let's try this one more time. Did I back down? No. Thank you. I will stand with you Together we will fight the patriarchal and misogynistic culture that all of our issues derive from. Completing the agenda of the GOP is not an option because you know what? We're gonna stop them. <laughs> we are still only 20% of the US House and Senate. We still have our uterus, quote unquote, 
we still have our uterus legislated more than guns. <laughs> Women are still being paid less. Women shouldered the burden of the greatest student loan in the history of the United States. And as Tony alluded to, we still do not have the ERA passed. Those issues and many others, we will face the challenges as we should. We are ready to build and mobilize our state chapters for grassroots actions. We will create a sense of urgency on economic justice, immigrant, LGBTQIA plus issues. We will facilitate your high impact coalition work. We will provide toolkits and training for legislative advocacy, but also to get back to the streets for nonviolent direct actions. We will lift up NOW's voices with high quality visibility media work. We will leverage today's technology to increase organizational efficiency, communication, and fundraising. We will use our resources wisely and continue to grow. We will be stronger if we motivate each other as we move forward on our march for women's right and girls' equalities. We will accept feedback from each and every one of you. This is vital for now to, grow, to go forward and be a stronger organization, both locally and globally. We are facing, and we're hopefully, of, in spite of all the challenges we are facing, we all know that we can succeed and we can combat and beat the GOP's agenda. <laughs> like you, we are all in this, all in this room, we have all found ourselves as activists in the driver's seat in many situations. Our bond is our shared love and commitment to build women and rights, women and girls equality and rights. So now I'm asking you to take a moment to do something that you've never done before, to elect the first women of color team. We are qualified and ready to lead the grassroots premier organization. I'm asking you to make history with Monica and me. I'm asking you to take a stand with us. I'm asking you to go for it, to fight, to win, to stand, and we shall all become better because of it. Thank you. And isn't it great to see strong women in charge? I just love it. Thank you. Let's clap for all of them. All right. Ooh, ooh, wow, wow, I'm energized. I, is anybody on Twitter? I, I'm hoping you're Twittering all this, tweeting out hashtag now 2017. Okay, it is time for our question and answer session. Uh, sure, yeah. Some. I'm going to call up Hala Ayala, who is running for a plug for her. She's running for a, a General Assembly in Virginia. Write her a check. Yeah. Good plug. <laughs> we just want to say thank you and go over some quick housekeeping rules. We ask that you keep your questions to 30 seconds so the candidates have time to answer as many questions as possible. We ask that we are polite and respectful. It's hard to run for office, I know. I, I'm out there every day, and these ladies have worked so hard. Give them a round of applause, and we're ready to start. All right, we'll start over here, and then ma'am. David Stewart, Iowa Now State Coordinator. In the program book a couple days ago, I went through it like I always do. And I was almost just stunned counting out the missing state coordinators in that book. 13 to 14 states have no state president or organization. If we're going to build chapters and build this organization, we have to have somebody in the state to help do it. Is there a plan out there someplace to help get this going again for those 14 missing states? 
Was that for a specific candidate? No, or? it's just out there in the ether. Okay, I'll just hand it to. Ooh, catch it. I'll, Tony and then China. Thanks for the question, David. So we are dedicated to strengthening our grassroots. We plan on coming into your hometown to organize, to train, to raise up the press, and most importantly, to do fundraising. Uh, we think it's really important. I do have experience in uh, helping to bring back Georgia Now, and we're proud to say that the secretary of Georgia Now at that time is now an elected official. Um, so really good work in Georgia, and we will continue to do that kind of work. China, you have one minute. David, I don't know if this mic is on, is it? Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Thank you, David, for asking that question because Monica and I were talking about the fact that the districts that was set up under the Modernization Committee and Task Force, I'm sorry, we have decided that if we're elected, that what we're gonna do is try to create each one of those districts to have their conferences so that they can get back to do the grassroots movement of selecting a district coordinator, finding out who doesn't have presidents, what chapters are dormant, what we can do to get in there and help you build and rebuild and reinstitute what you already have and create new and new projects and things to help you grow, whether around fundraising, whether it's around legislative lobbying, we would like to just come and be individually involved with those districts. Barbara Moore from Rochester, New York now. First of all, thank you uh, for these great candidates. Thank you for running. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm just not hearing a lot of promises. Are you going to be able to do it? And what I would think you need is more elected, paid officers. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, Monica and then Gilda. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I don't need a handy water when you're talking. <laughs> so I go now? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, first of all, China and I are women of our word, so we've proven that edu in our education, we've proven that professionally, um, but most importantly, we've discussed ways to be creative with fundraising. Uh, we talked about recruiting members, how to do that, uh, is to have a really uh, vibrant and cohesive, consistent communications plan. Um, that'll drive in more members, which will increase our funding. We also have to be creative. You know, the other night I couldn't go to bed because I was, you know, thinking about running and speeches and all that. And I thought it would be so cool to do like a festival for women and just like make money from that and it'd be a way to get together. We have to think creatively about that. We also, we also have to train our chapter and state leaders on other ways of, of uh, creating fundraising uh, opportunities as well. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you are on Facebook. You can actually create a campaign and have a little donate button on Facebook. There's Indiegogo, there's GoFundMe. We have ways to you know, create fundraising campaigns for our states and chapters, Thank and we you, have Monica. it for the, the office as well. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Wait, Gilda has oh, sorry. Oh, Gilda, she has you on. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. To create more office staff, we have to build a membership, and that's a given. We've created a, a financial um, plan and goals. The more members we bring in, the more membership we can create. In the process, we've also added a chapter service organizer who has been so helpful. And David, we have created two new chapters in Colorado, which is a major feat. So I'm very happy about that. That happened just after the election. So if we continue on the path of bringing in members, building up the membership, still being a little bit, um, <sighs> keeping hold of our finances, we can put people in the field. We can enable the chapters to learn how to do fundraising on their own, create relationships with the funders in their communities and teach them how to fundraise. Thank you. Thank you. Next on. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Stein, and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am one of those millennials that join now following the election, and I keep hearing a lot throughout the... <laughs> 
Um, and I, keep, I kept hearing throughout the two days how much we need to attract young people and keep them engaged, but we're more than Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook. So I would really like to know what is your plan to, keep, like, to bring young people into the organization and to keep us involved and to give us a role so that we're not just being taught things, but brought in to play a real role in the organization. <laughs> China, would you like to respond? Oh, I'm gonna take this one. She oh. said I could take this one as the, the token young person. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. I'm gonna stand up for this one. <laughs> uh, mostly because I need to sit up a little bit and stretch my legs. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. No, it's not on. The mic wasn't working, there we go. As vice president, I will make sure our mics work. Um, <laughs> Here's the thing, we've discussed this a lot. We, have, we look at this as three ways of how to engage young people. Number one, we need to effectively communicate. We say that, we say we're gonna use YouTube and Snapchat, and that's really important. We wanna create a really dynamic video campaign where we address all of our issues, all of our campaigns and videos to share. We have to have consistent branding. But once you have the people, what do you do with them? And that's the heart of her, of her question. Young people, we're out there, we care. We want clear, direct action. We want to feel like we have a voice. We will give that. We need to have clear campaigns. We, on our platform, if you've read it, please read it. We create two new platforms. My generation cares about action. We care about the Muslim ban. We care about immigration. We care about Black Lives Matter. And we're out there. You just don't see us because we're not here right now because we haven't been represented. And sometimes, you know, you can't be what you can't see. Somebody told me that. Uh, and I thought that was really powerful. You can't be what Thank you can't you, see, and we need to be seen. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, when I was the Florida Now State President, we had three high school chapters. One of the things that we did first is we held a retreat, and at that retreat, we had a representative from the women's funding movement attend and she helped to fund those high school chapters, and what they did is they held contests in junior high schools, asking those students to write what feminism meant to them, and the funding movement gave those students $300, $200, and $100. We plan on giving younger women leadership roles. They already are leaders when they come to us. They have a lot of talents that we don't have. And we need to recognize that. Our uh, young feminists in our chapters when I was the Florida Now president, I just turned our state conferences over to them. They did everything and we paid the bills. They decided who were the speakers were gonna be, they decided what the workshops were gonna be, they led those workshops, they were the speakers, they did the graphic art, they were fabulous and our conferences were way fun. More fun okay. Over here. And if it's for a specific team or candidate, you could indicate that as well, your question. Juanita Baker at Indian River County, Florida, now. So mine is for all of you because I l you all have great energy, each one of you four, and it's also characteristic that they're your opponent opponents. But what my question is, how are you gonna incorporate your opponents to help you into your <laughs> issue, including, including, I'm first, yeah. including, sorry, including the opponents of the Democratic women and the opponents of the Republican Party and even Trump. Okay. Hey, Juanita, Juanita. I, I really didn't understand the rest, I, including them and now, you mean, of the leaders of the Republican Party? No, I'm just saying, characteristic in our organization, there are people we have opponents, and we need to show our compassion and figure out how to work together, just as on the national level, how are you going to appeal to them? Okay, so here's, here's the thing. I look around the room, it's in our culture to have these contested elections. And they can, they're very passionate, that's a really good word for heated. And, uh, and, and we elect somebody new, and then we go home, and then we roll our sleeves up and we work together. 
And that's what's really important. I see women in this room that we are on the other side of issues when we have floor fights and resolutions. But I respect them. I see them year after year. We don't all have to see, we have to, of course, continue following all of our resolutions and our plans when we make decisions, but we don't have to agree on absolutely everything. But we do have to respect each other because we are here to change the culture. We are here to work together to do that. Hi. You know, the one thing that I found out that I've been saying all along, the 54% of those women that voted for Trump, we should have been out there talking to them, not telling them how they should vote, but giving them the information that say, have you thought about this? Look at what the impact this would have. And as far as us working together in this organization, I think we have to have a unified voice no matter who is elected. We as a team up here, our motto is team. That means complete team. We're all fighting for the same issues. We want the same results. So we still have to have a unified voice to go out there and fight the agenda of the GOP. There is no I in team. Thank you. Jackie, my, my salsa sister. Salsa sisters. I know. So yes, um, I have to say I work in politics and I've never seen campaigning like this ever in my life. And it's been, I gotta be honest, a little disappointing as a young person who's come to now. So in, um, sorry, but it's true. Um, so I would like each team to say something positive about the other team. One positive thing that you could say about each other. I've got the mic. Let me start. Um, I've worked with both with Gilda and Tony on various projects during the course of our board. So the one thing I can say about them is that I do believe they have heart and dedication towards now. And they believe in the movement and the issues that now are, are now progressively trying to go forward with. Thank you, China. And I've also worked with everybody up here, you know, most people here and now, and we will move forward. You know, there, we can't control what others say, and, but we can change the culture and now to all pull together and be activists and good feminists. And we are gonna be good feminists and we're all gonna be, remain friends after this is over because we all want the same thing. We want equality. Oh, we did. I, in, all day yesterday at the, um, I, I, I think you guys are great feminists. All day yesterday I was giving you little huggies and encouraging you because <laughs> I, was, I was really concerned that uh, as a young feminist that um, she needed a little boost. So didn't I do that? I was positive all when we did our, our thing yesterday. You were, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I get where you're coming from with the question. You know, there have, there have been, you know, negative things said and all that, and I think what this election can teach us, because I believe in every experience, everything that happens, uh, we have to be able to learn from it. I've learned how to work with you all, and, and I really appreciate that, and yes, I appreciate, you know, your, your niceties, and we just, like, totally overrode this 30-second uh, limit. <laughs> Ours is a minute. So I want to say that uh, I believe that Monica has done an awesome job and she is a rising star, not only in now, but hopefully she's going to be running for political office someday. Yeah. I also want to say China and I served on the board together for four years. We were on the Combating Racism Committee from day one, and I really respect her and I really respect the work that we've done together. Remember, Sisters United will never be defeated. Okay. United will never be divided. Sisters United will never be divided. Sisters United will never be divided.
That doesn't count as the 30 seconds of the minute. <laughs> I feel, uh, I'm Donna Shirelli from uh, New York State, uh, New York now, uh, sorry. <laughs> New York State, Long Island uh, chapter, Mid-Suffolk now. And um, I think my question was sort of, was pretty much answered. I was going to ask uh, each of you to uh, describe if you weren't elected to the office that you're running for, what would you be doing moving forward? So I, I think um, if there's anything anyone can add to that, um, I guess more, you know, if, if your positions would be changing in any way and, and um, you know, what, uh, what you would be con continuing to do uh, either in now or, or, or not. So yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Okay, I, I think that the question was is that if I wasn't elected then, for each of us though, but, but if I wasn't elected, how would I still be involved with NOW, is that right? Okay, so I've been involved in NOW since 1989 and uh, currently I serve as the uh, chairwoman of the, uh, the action committee of the Florida National Organization for Women and I plan on continuing in that role. I have no uh, desire to leave now. I plan to be just as active. This is my organization, this is where I live. It's in my heart, it will always be in my heart, and I always plan to be doing the work. Well, I cr um, created and designed a domestic violence institute, and we do a lot of education around DV and sexual assault from our chapter in Washington State, our Tacoma chapter. Um, and I just would continue to do what I'm doing to impact women and help women become safe in that, in that arena. Um, and anything else that our chapters or our um, organization has that calls on me to do, I will be there to facilitate. Go ahead, next question. Hi, I'm Monica, I'm from Washington, D.C. now. <laughs> um, I'm also one of our millennial members, although I've been a member of NOW for almost five years. Um, so this election is really exciting to me because we've been talking a lot about intersectionality, and I think that's something that uh, my generation in particular is very um, interested and excited about, especially in the feminist movement. Um, and so we've talked a lot about how to make sure that feminism is actually actively advancing the liberation of all people, not just white women. Um, and so it's great to hear everyone talking about intersectionality, but my question is for the presidential candidates. Um, what actions will you take to really demonstrate your commitment to centering the voices of women of color in now um, and really making space for them to be involved? Does this answer it? <laughs> First of all, I am a woman of color and I stood up just to emphasize that. I think a lot of time when women of color see who they are as a reflection within the organization, they know they're represented. So I would like to also be able to reach out to other organizations and bring their voices to the table so that they could be heard. Because historically, we have not had a table, so we couldn't invite them to the table. But we're creating a table. So we want to invite everyone to come and have a voice. Well, I think it's really important, and as I said in my speech, that we, um, we organize and we lead uh, using uh, different points of view. That's why I think it's so important that we diversify our National Advisory Committee and include uh, women of color from all walks of life. And also, I do have experience in coalition building with other organizations. I continue to do that. Leanne Russell, who's the chairman of the National Board of the NAACP, wrote us a beautiful endorsement for the work that we did together a number of years ago, and I'll continue to do that work. But I think most importantly is I, can, I will continue to listen and to make sure that women of color are in the leadership at all levels of now. Thank you. Sue Gibson, Capital Area, Missouri Now. 
Um, I would like both China's and Tony's perspective on this. This is about the homophobic posts on China's Facebook page where media can see them and the reputation of the organization can be damaged. I was a child when NOW was formed and lesbians were called the Lavender Menace and it affected my self-esteem well into young adulthood. Why do you feel a responsibility, China, to provide a platform for someone else's hate speech? And would you also compromise NOW's support for abortion rights and our anti-racism work when faced with religious imposition? Thank you for that question, and I want to answer that. Um, I've had this conversation with you on Facebook quite often. I will not allow anyone First Amendment right to be taken away. What she is discussing, you know how move on and they post different um, activities, petitions and whatever, then they do surveys. You answer the surveys and it rolls over. You can click on it, you can see who answered what, how they answered it. I politely put underneath, you have a right to your opinion. It doesn't necessarily represent who I am or what I think about the subject matter. Therefore, I was not going to erase that person's comments because they were not mine. If it was part of something that I had put out, I would have taken it down. So therefore, it wasn't my petition, it was not my voice, and I was not going to erase their comments. And as far as what I would do around racism, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I okay, want to respect here, here her time. No, no, no. I don't no, want to no, respect. No. As, Carol, as Carol Mosley Braun said, I've got the mic. <laughs> so, another Illinois Now sister. You know, I, under, I understand. I understand. I hear you, Sue. Because I, I just celebrated my second anniversary with my wife, so I understand. So what we will do, Tony, I will allow you one minute. And then I will allow Monica 30 seconds and Gilda 30 seconds. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I yes. just don't want to assign. There are two like you there. They're accusations. Mm -hmm. And you're the one that did not agree with them. I feel like you're taking no. a hard time. And then for you to say that implies that you're agreeing with what they're saying. No, I'm, I'm trying to. I apologize, Monica. I'm just trying to, to. I'm trying to facilitate. I'm trying to make sure that everybody understands that this is a professional session. We have to be civil with each other. That is part of feminist behavior, is to be respectful to hear everyone, and to acknowledge everyone. And I acknowledge China. I appreciate all the things she has done. I acknowledge Sue. I appreciate all the things she's done. And so I will allow Tony one minute, and then we will go to the next question. The candidates will be around all afternoon for you to talk with them personally, and it may be better if we all talk to each person personally to on issues like this. So Tony, one minute, and then we will go back to Terry Sanders, president of, of Florida now. OK, Tony, one minute. I think that it's really important that we maintain in our democracy the separation of church and state. I think that in so many cases, religion is being used as an excuse to discriminate against all of us. We know about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and how it is destroying our rights to abortion and birth control and jobs for, and for the, our LGBTQIA plus community. If women that are unmarried can be fired. They won't have to be able to, um, they might be kicked out of their housing. We know all of these things and we think it's really important that we keep religion separated from public policy. That is huge. Thanks. Okay. Terry? Uh, Terry, San Terry Sanders, Florida Now. Um, as a white woman, um, my question is actually directed to China and Monica because I'm confused about our role in combating racism and intersectionality. Um, I totally related when Monica said that, you know, you entered the room and I want to, sorry, I want to quote you, I don't want to be you know, accurate at all, um, why women of color are separated out, and I completely agree. On the other hand, I have an email that China made public and asked to be made public, so I'm not, you know, and I'm just going to read a little bit of it that confuses me on the other side of it. So I want you to clarify what white women can do. 
So it says, do not filter this through the lenses of what you as white women see the issues are because you will not have the support from the community you are trying to help. I do not mean it as an insult, but you cannot be seen as the great white savior coming in with all the answers for the black and people of color community's entire problem. You can't tell communities of color what their problems are, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I'm confused, do we, what do we do? What is our role? So that's from Monica in China. This is a really important conversation to have because there have been a lot of uh, racial, uh, racist comments that have come to both of us and with racial undertones. And I believe it's a bit patronizing to say you want to bring women of color into the organization, you want to put them in leadership, but then you have an issue when we're running for the highest office and now. Um, what white women can do is to keep doing what you've been doing. We're not asking for all the power. We're asking for power to be distributed evenly and equally. We, you continue to be allies, you continue to show up, you continue to be a chapter leader in your community because maybe your community is all white. That's what you continue to do. You continue to do the work and you share information with us, you share resources with us, and you continue to be an ally, that's it. But like I said before, you can't be what you can't see and if you want more people of color, if you want young people in this organization, you need to start reflecting that leadership. And I'm not your token Latina, and she's not your token black woman. We have the educational and the professional experience to back it up, and that needs to be recognized more than just the skin color or the age. The statement that she just read off, what it means is that a lot of times you go into communities of color and you say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is the information. You do not ask, what can we do to help you? How can we help you? You do not understand completely all issues within all communities. You are one person. You have an understanding of a lot of things, but you still have to educate yourself around certain things in other communities because you don't live it, you don't walk it, all you do is talk it. I'm sorry. What was okay. That? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. It is 1147. I apologize. I apologize. You know, I understand we're now. We're fierce. We're feminist. We're in our faces sometimes. But we are sisters and brothers. So let's remember when we leave this room, we are leaving together. Because if we don't leave together, we're going to be scattered. And we will not be able to fight Trump. We will not be able to fight the Republicans. We will not be able to go home and help our brothers and sisters at home. So when we leave this room, we are leaving together. When we leave this room, we're leaving together. Sisters United. Sisters United. Sisters United. Sisters United will not be defeated. Sisters United will not be defeated will never be defeated. Sisters United will never be defeated. Sisters United will never be defeated. Sisters United will never be defeated. Okay. Now, as I said before, our candidates will be here all afternoon. They've been here all week, and I'm sure they are ready to turn around and go home right now. But talk to them. Find out about their platforms, what they want for us and for now. Uh, just a reminder, voting begins at 4.30 in Legacy South 3. The polls will be open for two hours. And before you leave, I want you to know the next session is the PAC session. And Tony's coming up to talk about that. I'm sorry, Terry. A little Freudian slip. Thank you all so much. Thank you all four candidates for running. The next thing that's happening is our PAC lunch. 
So uh, you, you leave this room. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, you leave this room and uh, go grab your box lunch and come right back in because uh, the pack lunch starts at 12 o'clock. Can't wait to see you all there. Thank you all so much for everything you do. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Tony, Tony. <laughs>